So I'm very excited to have Geraldo Camillo this morning as our presenter. Um, I was just saying that he and I uh, met in person at the Urban Pollinators Conference in Traverse City a few years ago. Um, he's, he heads the Billiken Bee Lab there at St. Louis University. Um, they have a lot of exciting projects going on, including an inventory of the bees in St. Louis, in St. Louis um, working on identifying the, the role of uh, bees and other pollinators in urban orchards. Um, and um, he just presented a um, summary of some of his research work working with homeowners and householders in St. Louis uh, who are certified in uh, Audubon's Backyard Landscape uh, Habitat, Wildlife Habitat Program, kind of looking at does that change the uh, increase in habitat and biodiversity? Um, what effect does it have on, um, on those folks um, as being engaged for wildlife uh, and pollinators? So um, some really exciting projects, really glad to have him here today. He, his lab uh, is out there um, doing research in the city and also has a great lab facility. They have a, an outstanding bee course um, that is just about filled for 2022. But if you're um, an aspiring researcher or graduate student or other who's really looking to look at the details of bee identification, I encourage you to follow up and uh, try to get on that list to attend that, that session. Really great, great work. So Gerardo, at this point, I will um, attempt to turn the, um, the podium over to you. Thanks so much for being with us. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you, uh, Denise. Uh, it, it's always excellent when I get to share, you know, whatever little we have learned about bees in urban environments with the public in general. So uh, I will... Uh, I will try to, let me see, share my screen, uh, uh, get the ball rolling on my end. Whoops, wrong, uh, uh, this one, there we go. We got the right one, there we go. So uh, what I'm gonna try to do is give you an overview of what we have learned in the past about pollinators, in urban environments in general. And from there, we'll try to drill out to the specifics of, of what drive pollinators in urban environments based upon our research in St. Louis. So the overall, let try it over here. It's not liking it. Uh, let me try it again. Uh -huh. There we go. Now it should work. So a brief outline uh, of how we're going to proceed uh, here is I'll give a short overview of pollinators and specifically in bees because this will be relevant later on in the talk. Then uh, the relevance or, or the importance of the so-called pollinator crisis and why that matters for urban environments. And then we'll get to the actual research of first bees in the city and then more specifically the bees in St. Louis city. Okay. So pollination is the way that plants have sex. You know, you, it's basically, you know, changing male gametes or moving male gametes in general towards female uh, gametes. So in this case, pollen towards uh, plants, uh, eggs uh, or ova. And there are a whole host of doing this. There's wind pollination, there's water driven pollination. So we call those passive pollination. And then there is of course, animal pollination. And there are of course, vertebrates that are pollinators you know, bats in tropical systems are important pollinators. And then there are, of course, invertebrate pollinators. In, uh, and in general, of all those pollinators, uh, the only group that intentionally collects pollen are the bees, okay? All the other ones, they are actually going after the nectar and essentially getting covered in, in pollen and moving that pollen somewhere else as they go for further nectar collection in the next flower. But of all those, you know, vertebrates, just invertebrates, as I mentioned, these are the only ones that actually go after the pollen 
and intentionally shake the anthers of the flowers where the pollen is, is found and therefore extracting pollen in a intentional fashion. This has resulted in a co-evolution between flowering plants and bees that have led to a tremendous diversification, you know, tremendous diversity of both flowers and bees. And as you can see here from this picture, there's a whole range of sizes and colors and shapes and behaviors that go along with that range of uh, bees. And today, worldwide, there are over 24,000 species of bees that have been scientifically described. And about 4,200 of those occur in North America. And they're found in, and especially in cities, there are five families that are very prevalent. That's the sweat bee family that includes, you know, the metallic sweat bees. Then there are the Colitids, which are the uh, uh, the cellophane or polyester bees, and this is the you know the native cellophane bee. Then we have the plaster bees or mason bees, the leaf cutter bees, and of course the bumblebee family, where the honeybee is uh, contained too. Okay, and along with that, functional as well as uh, uh, phylogenetic or, or you know evolutionary diversity comes also a tremendous diversity in sizes and morphologies and what you see here is the most of you will recognize it that's you know the face or the head of the uh, the eastern common carpenter bee Celocopa virginica which if you have a deck or any kind of wooden structure in your yard you're probably familiar with as well as a fairy bee which is the, so we have the largest bee in North America and the smallest bee in North America. Okay. So when most of the time when people think about bees, they think about the honeybee and that is the completely wrong species to represent bees in general. Honeybees are a domesticated animal. So when you ask a, uh, a, a bird expert, you know, what is a bird to represent all birds? You know, they never answer chickens because chickens are domesticated animals. They really are not representative of birds in general because of that domestication process. The same occurs with bees. The honeybee is not really a good example, a good representative, because just like chickens or cattle or pigs, is a domesticated organism. So unlike honeybees, uh, most bees are solitary. There is no queen worker case system. There is no colony. It's usually a single female and they either have one generation per year or maybe two generations per year. Many are, you know, they dig a hole into the ground and that's where they lay their eggs. So they're ground nesters, they are twig nesters. So where they nest is a very important aspect of uh, bee ecology. And furthermore, you know, the, the honeybee is the ultimate jack of all trades. You know, it's, it therefore is a very lousy pollinator, but in general, it can visit a large number of species. Many bees that we study are specialists or if they're not strict specialists, they are what you like, call like oligolectic. They, they have a very narrow range of plants they visit. Okay. And why is that? Because why is this important? Because bees, as I mentioned earlier, are an important group of pollinators. These uh, bees represent the broadest and most efficient kind of pollinators we have in nature. And by the same token, they pollinate the bulk of our fruits, nuts, and veggies are, are, are plant uh, be pollinated. Uh, furthermore, you know, uh, about a third, you said one in three bites of food 
that we consume is being pollinated. And furthermore, you know, when it comes to actual nutrition, then it's about 70% of our nutrition is come from bee pollinated plants. And finally, honeybees can pollinate a lot of plants, for example, tomatoes, you know, so there are a lot of plants that require what is called boss pollination in scientific term is sonication. So we know that essentially, you know, bees can only pollinate about 30 to 40% of uh, all the plants that are, and uh, fruits that we consume. And therefore is important that we have a broad range of pollinators available in our plants uh, for, our, for our crops. As you can see here, this is a squash bee and a single squash bee female can be the equivalent of about 30 to 60 honeybees when it comes to squash. So let's talk a little bit about the, the so-called pollinator crisis. And this is something we are all very aware or at least have heard that sometime or another. And, you know, it's, it's important that we understand what it is, what are the causes, and how it's actually affecting uh, the overall ecosystem. Okay. And uh, as my colleague Damon Hall has mentioned, you know, just like honeybees that, you know, are suffering or, are actually feeling the consequences of the changes in their environment, our, our native bees are also feeling the consequences of that changing environment. The big difference is that honeybees, when it's, it's a domesticated organism, therefore we can provide them with medicine when they get sick, we can provide them, we can supplement them with uh, uh, food when food resources are low, and by the same token, we're providing them with the house. We built hives for them and we manage those hives. Uh, nobody's doing that with native bees. So the increased expansion of the industrialized agriculture, you know, the, the greater acreage of, you know, commodity crops like soybeans, like corn uh, is contributing to that decline. There is less and less room for native habitat for our native bees. Added to that is the expansion of pesticides used, especially the so-called neonics in the United States. And as you can see that where colony collapse disorder started being documented in the early 2000s, coincides also with the expansion of neonics used in agriculture. Uh, and the increased use, you know, that as, as colony collapse disorder uh, started taking uh, off, uh, that meant there is a greater demand to replace the bees, uh, the, the hives that are being lost. So there is an increased expansion on the managed honeybee uh, business that leads then to increase exchange of parasites and disease agents from honeybees to native bees uh, population or wild bee population. So as you said, this is a death by a thousand cots. Um, and when you put all those elements together and you see where is that we have a great decline in native bee populations. And at the same time, you have the greatest demand for pollination services, let's just say, ends up being in the big agricultural areas in the nation, which includes, of course, the Central Valley of California, you know, the Southern High Plains, the Mississippi River Valley, as well as the breadbasket. So it's really not a great uh, 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 story when you realize that the bulk of the organisms that pollinate your plants are going down exactly in the same places where you're growing your food. Okay. And nothing, absolutely nothing will destabilize a government faster than people going hungry. 
in back in 2015, uh, uh, Congress passed in a unanimous fashion, you know, the national strategy for pollinator health, uh, which was, you know, very rare. You can see that you can actually, everybody put differences apart and this was instantly passed and in order to address, you know, food security in the United States. But it's not only in the United States when this was occurring, but worldwide. So we now, we suspect that worldwide, at least 60% of the pollinator species that are important for pollination of all crops, not just the ones that are grown in the United States, but worldwide and not just bees, but also, you know, bats, birds uh, and, and uh, flies are in some way, shape or form declining in their abundances. So we see then that the, the pollinators are decreasing in urban environments. I mean, in, in agricultural environments, they're decreasing in many natural environments. So about a decade ago, as we were going, as a, my lab was starting to sample bees in, in green urban spaces, uh, I started noticing a trend in the literature that a lot of other people were also looking at bees in urban environments. Okay? So we know that there's been a tremendous impetus for understanding the ecology of urban cities. And the reason for that is that the urban population growth is occurring at a much faster rate than the total world population. So we already know that by you know a decade ago, over a decade ago, already 50% of the human population lived in an urban environment, in a city. Okay. And by 2050, which is only you know, uh, uh, 29 <laughs> years away, uh, uh, is expected that over 9 billion people will live in the planet and two out of every three of those will be living in a city. So this is a migration at the scale that the human population have never seen before. So when you look at that distribution, you see that it's really not evenly distributed across the world. We have currently about a hundred cities worldwide that have a population of five million people or more. And at least, you know, a dozen of those have about 10 million people or more. So when you put all that combined, it means that the total urban infrastructure has to double in about 30 years in order to accommodate that many people. So as that was, you know, we were coming to that realization, uh, my colleague Damon Hall, myself, and Dr. Rebecca Tonieto, who's now at uh, Michigan, uh, was a postdoc of mine at the time. Uh, we were serving the literature and realized that a lot of people were reporting the same kind of results we were getting, you know, throughout Europe, uh, Canada, Central America, the United States. And the relevant point that we were observing was that not only were cities hosting large bee diversities, but also when you compare many of those sites with nearby adjacent agricultural and rural landscape, the bee diversity in the city was greater than that of rural landscapes. And I don't know about you, but I rather have my have my bees where I'm growing my food, not necessarily when people are growing lawns or, or, you know, or cement. It just, it doesn't mash very well. Okay. So at the time we published uh, this paper, which is where we take the, uh, uh, the title of the presentation. And so Damon took the lead uh, with me, you know, assisting and Becky Toniedo and Jeff Allerton in Europe took the lead, uh, Gordon Frankie out West. And as you can see, a lot of other 
very uh, uh, relevant names in that list, people working in urban environments, we all agreed that yes, this is a pattern that is observed, is in our data, is repeatable, uh, but we have no idea really what was going on. So we know that cities host very large diversity, especially compared to urban and rural uh, areas, and at times comparable to that of natural environments. Okay. But at the same time, there is you know, a lot of synthesis going on, looking at you know, vertebrate species, you know, birds, mammals, trees, so on and so forth, and the overall pattern that everybody observed was that the number of species really takes a nose dive as you get from natural to urban environments. And this, the species that you find are very generalist species. They can tolerate a lot. What we were proposing in that paper was that when it comes to bees, the, that is not the pattern we observe in bees, that bees can actually that they don't feel the same level of filtering effect that other groups of animals and plants are, are perceiving at the same time. Okay. So with that pattern described, uh, we wanted to drill into the specifics of how is that bees are distributed within the city and what mechanisms are leading to the distribution to try to explain the broader pattern of distribution. So we have been sampling, as I mentioned, for a decade in the city of St. Louis. And unlike the other cities that uh, we mentioned in the previous slide uh, worldwide, uh, St. Louis belongs to a sisterhood of so-called shrinking cities of which, as you can see, there is a broad, a large number of them in Ohio, including Cleveland, which Mary will be talking about it tomorrow. And these are cities that in order for you to join the sisterhood, uh, you need to have lost at least 1% of your core, of your actual inner core or inner urban uh, population, 1% for at least 10 consecutive years. Okay? Uh, so St. Louis, as you can see here in the decade from 2000 to 2010, lost over 8% of its population. And of all the cities, of course, Detroit represents the poster child of the shrinking city. The change in New Orleans uh, was due mostly to Katrina, although since then now has been uh, uh, consistently losing species losing population in, in the urban core. So it's really now really a true uh, uh, shrinking city. Okay. So here's an example of Detroit. Uh, many of you, you know, are familiar with uh, being so close. So this is Detroit in the heyday of the, uh, uh, of the car industry. Okay. And here is the same area you know in the early 2000s so you can see there's a lot of vacancy there is a lot of green space or open space and this causes very serious problems for city managers because they're you know the tax base is not there and yet you still need to provide services to the few houses that are left behind the few people that are living there cleveland have the same kinds of issues so Needless to say, St. Louis is not really that far behind. Okay. So city planners and decision makers are left with a very serious problem. You see, you know, what to do with all these vacant lots and open spaces. And part of the answer, especially here in St. Louis, is that these have been converted to areas to grow food or have been converted into some kind of park in order to provide, you know, uh, at some environmental or open air uh, amenity. Okay. So this is an example of uh, one of our urban farms very near the university. So you can see here the very top of our med school. This is one of my grad students at the time. 
And this is what, you know, the, uh, an urban farm looks like. Okay? And they, we have a bunch of them across the city. Okay? And once we started sampling, you know, all these, you know, urban green spaces, okay? And as of, you know, this month, we have identified 209 species of bees in the city of St. Louis, which is 47% of all the species found in the state. We have 49 genera and we have five families. And especially where that photo came from, we have a well-established and thriving colony of Bombus fraternus, which is one of the most threatened and endangered species of bumblebees in North America. So this first study, what we did, we divided the city in base of, and, and locations within the city based upon you know, the type of management that that location was under. And there were three kinds of management. These were prairie pockets. Uh, Mary will probably talk about those a lot tomorrow. Uh, we had community gardens, so these are uh, bacon lots that have been turned into uh, to grow food for uh, the local residents. And then we have urban farms. So these are lots that are much more intense. The entire lot is used and usually is in order not just to provide food for uh, the local families, but also they sell it at uh, the uh, local uh, uh, market. And all the sampling took place between 2014 and 2016. By the same token, we divided the city in based upon area, but really it's because, you know, when you look at the north side of St. Louis, it's mostly African-American, uh, it's very poor, and there's a large number of uh, uh, vacant lots. Over 80% of all the vacant lots in the city are, are found in the north side. Then we have the center corridor. This is where a lot of change is taking place. We have a new Ikea, there's new Target. Uh, this is where the university is located. So there is a lot of change in this area, but also there's a large diversity of ethnic and cultural uh, backgrounds of people in this area. And there's still a significant number of vacant lots in the central corridor. And finally, the south side of the city, which is very stable, these neighborhoods, there are very few uh, uh, vacant lots. Uh, the income is significantly higher and the population is over 70% white, educated, and the middle income is in the 60,000s or so. So as you can see, geography then corresponds to other variables like ethnicity and income. Okay. So the way we sample, we did all the sampling via area netting at a very specific rate of one person per hour per quarter hectare. Okay. This allows then to compare, you know, so now we have equal effort across all sites. Okay. Uh, all the sampling was aerial netting with pin identified, sorted by location and identify two species. So because not all management types are found in all parts of the city, we could not do a full comparison contrast, but we'll show you, you know, results that are consistent across this all sites. So for all these various prairie pockets, so these are sites that have been abandoned and then now you have na some native vegetation and you see then how our effort, you know, the number of times we sample those sites versus the number of species we identify. There are two important pieces of information from this kind of analysis. Uh, the first one is the slope. How are you approaching the asymptote, which is an indication of, you know, that you basically have collected the bulk of the species present. Uh, and second is the point of inflection. So telling you, ah, we are really approaching that point. So for prairie pockets, the slope is 0 0.46. Another way you can interpret this is that it will take, you know, two sampling efforts in order to find a new species. Actually take a little bit more than two. 
uh, uh, two efforts. And then the inflection point saying that by the time between this 11th and our 12th sampling uh, time, the curve, the line started curving. Okay, so that's for prairie pockets. Okay. Uh, for community gardens, as you can see here, the slope is a lot steeper, that is going much faster, and there was no effective inflection point. So this is saying that we have not sampled you know, enough in terms of community gardens in order to identify species. Be every time you go back, you tend to find one new species. And this was even worse for urban farms. Okay. In urban farms, every time you go and resample again, we were getting you know, almost two new species in our sample from our urban farms. So when it comes to management, urban farms seem to gain new species at a faster rate than any other kind of management. Then when it comes to location, okay, so when you look at the south side of the species, again, there was no significant inflection point, but the slope was about, you know, you're gaining about two thirds of a B. So it would take three samples to gain two new species. When it comes to the central corridor, where you have a lot more vacancy, you have a lot of different people that have different kinds of plants, you know, in their yard or in their community gardens, the slope was significantly higher. And again, there was no inflection, no significant inflection point, meaning that you're gaining species really fast. And this was even steeper or, or it was more in, equal intense, not more in the north side of the city. Again, where you have a greater range of you know, vacant lots and you have a greater uh, number of people uh, putting in community gardens and working in urban farms. Okay. So what the hell is happening here? And as I mentioned, you know, it's the way that people perceive the environment and the way they manage the environment. In areas where there's a lot of aesthetic value in the way that the environment look and the perception that you're messy or that you are unkept resulted in a significant decrease in the diversity of bee species. Alternatively, in those gardens in the center corridor, as well as the north side, where that expectation of tidiness and being perceived as an unkept, uh, people don't care about it. We, we observe a significant increase in the diversity of the species present. So definitely the way that people manage the environment as a function of their perception, as well as their aesthetic values uh, seems to contribute to the total abundance and diversity of bees in the city of St. Louis, okay? Another way we can then look at this, we can see how species are distributed. So we're gonna look at bumblebees, which are you know, an important group of pollinators because this is the main group of boss pollinators that things like tomatoes and eggplants and peppers, you know, members of the uh, Solanaceae, you know, potato, tobacco, uh, like to be buzz pollinated. You know, they perceive that buzzing and they release the pollen. So when you go to the south side of the city, okay, so I'm in the south side of the city, I will only find two species of bumblebee, the, the brown belted and the common eastern bumblebee are the only two that I found in the south side, okay? So as I move from the south side to the center corridor, okay, I not only I get those two, I also add the two spotted, I add the American bumblebee, Bumbus pennsylvanicus, which is one of the species that has been decreasing, you know, uh, at a fast rate throughout uh, Eastern North America. We also, we add the golden brown, uh, the golden black bumblebee, uh, Bumbus aricomus. And as I mentioned, we add one of the most threatened bumblebees in North America, Bombus fraternus, 
And not only do I find all those in the center corridor, I also find them in the north side and we can add bombus fervidus, uh, 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 you know, the, the, a, to the species in, north, in the north side, okay? So we see there's a gradient of species diversity, species richness as you move from the south to the north. Another super important group of bees are so-called kleptoparasitic bees, or these are uh, also cuckoo bees. They lay their eggs in the nest of other bees. So these are nest parasites and they're super important because in order for you to have a nest parasite, you know, having a, 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 a consistent population, you need to have the host or host species, they lay their eggs usually in one or two or maybe three different species of bees. And those bees have to be present and they have to be in large enough numbers that can tolerate the parasitism of the cuckoo, uh, cuckoo bees, okay? So when I go to the south side, there are only five species of cuckoo bees in the south side. There are 12 in the center corridor and there are 18 in the north side. Once more, there is a significant gradient of species richness as you go from the south to the north side of the city. Okay. So we see that the distribution of bee diversity in the city is not, uh, 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 cons it's not even, you know, there is specific gradient and the gradient seems to be correlated with the way that people keep and maintain uh, their immediate surroundings. You know, do, do I have a messy yard? Do I let the weeds grow, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, that seems to correlate with that uh, issue. But remember that the, that space is a space that in general, people don't like. City don't, cities don't like that kind of space because it disrupts the tax base. It disrupt the way that we provide services. And it's the result of a lot of inequities and a lot of, of issues dealing with, in St. Louis, it's, it's directly correlated with redlining issues from back in the uh, 60s and 70s. Okay. So we wanted to drill even further down. We wanted to go to specific individual homeowners. And this is important because depending on the city, you know, private homeowners are accounting for anywhere between 40 to 70% of the green space in a city, depending on the state and the city that you are located, okay? And as I said, this is what we call Nobel ecosystems that are human built. Uh, of course, Scott McIver will talk a lot more about these on Thursday. But for our purposes, we look at these as a gradation for what we call very intentional novel ecosystem. So you have grasses and you have trees that you know, did not occur in this place. You know, they're brought from somewhere else. They're established there. They bring their own bugs. They bring their own microbes, so on and so forth. And this requires a lot of energy and nutrients to keep a single species of, of grass, you know, occurring in that environment. Uh, of course, this is then the kind of on the other end of the spectrum, and Mary will talk about this a lot more tomorrow, uh, what we call unintentional novel ecosystem. So what happens once you remove or do not have any of that energy and nutrient inputs, you end up with, you know, much greater plant diversity that leads to greater insect and bee diversity and bird diversity, so on and so forth. It has much more greater persistence. So you don't need the inputs of nutrients and energy, but it has fairly low appeal. So the question that we're trying to ask here, can we strike a balance you know, between these two, you know, an environment that has greater appeal but you know lower inputs, okay. and that's then where the concept of human facilitation comes into play. Okay. And if you have enough human facilitation across a city, you may be able to change the dynamics 
or bee diversity across the entire city. And this is something that Doc Talamy has been, you know, uh, promoting and champion for, you know, for over three decades now. And it seems that some of these efforts are really, you know, taking root. And when you look at not only his large nationwide uh, uh, program, you know, you actually can see that there is a large diversity of these home conservation programs across the nation. Some are national, some are statewide, some are citywide. Okay. Uh, in this case, we're going to be looking at this specific program called Bring Conservation Home, which is a program uh, run by the St. Louis chapter of the Audubon Society. Okay. And the idea of all these programs is basically to go from something like this of course, to something like these, in which you have much greater uh, uh, plant and floral diversity, much lower inputs, and can then come back year after year after year. Okay. So when we look at the Audubon Spring Conservation Home, it's a tremendously successful program in St. Louis, and they actually have a sister program in Portland, Oregon, and they are about to, to launch a similar one in Baltimore. At the time, we had over 1,700 homes that have been enrolled, spanning you know, over 150 kilometers east to west and over 120 kilometers north to south. So we encompass a whole range of you know, rural, exurban, uh, suburban, very urban, mention it, we probably have it here. And not only that, but also we have areas, uh, five at least ecoregions that were contained within this expanse. The really important part, the, the, what set this program apart from a lot of other programs is that actually you get certified. A person from the Audubon Society will come inspect your program and tell you what you need to do in order to achieve different levels of certification. Okay. And the ones that are important for our study is that you, know, you are given uh, this consultation, you're given the result, the summary of the consultation, and you're saying, okay, so you can achieve one on three levels of certification. Okay. In silver, you said that at least you're going to add 10% of your area uh, will be in terms of native plants. You're going to remove at least 50% of the invasive plants and have at least two canopy layers. And you can go all the way to platinum certified in which half of the area of your, uh, 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 of your yard will be converted to native plantings. You will remove 100% of the invasive plants and you will have four layers in your canopy. So as you can see, this then represents an excellent experiment in which we can then compare the level of certification. Plus we have the group of people that get the consultation, but did not decided not to achieve <laughs> any layer level of certification. So we also have a control. So, Of those 1,700 homes for this one specific aspect that we're looking at bees, we selected a subset of 45 homes okay, and we divided between certification level and we have three levels in which there are those that did not, decided not to be certified. So they manage their home just the same way the rest of the neighbors do. Those that are silver certified and we found that when it comes to bees, the gold and the platinum really did not matter. It was the same thing for them. And we have a full set of, of non-silver gold platinum houses in the urban, suburban, and the exurban. Okay, so actually we have five for each of those uh, nine combinations. So a total of 45 homes. Those were visited, you know, once a month. 
uh, again, aerial sampling uh, using nets with the same rate of, you know, one person hour per uh, quarter hectare. Okay. So now we can actually compare how many bees are in your backyard, literally. Okay. So as you can see here, so here we are in the urban environment and we have those that are not certified. Those are silver and those that are gold or platinum. So you can see that the total abundance really doesn't change much as a function of certification level within the urban environment. The platinum probably expands a little bit, but in general, no, it doesn't. When it comes to the suburban environment, okay, notice that both the non as well as the silver are significantly decreased compared to the urban is only the gold and platinum that actually compares to the urban environment in terms of bee diversity. But notice that is in the suburban that you really get the spread in terms of how many bees you have. This is total number of bees, not, not the species. And finally, when you get to the exurban environment, then the silver really then uh, uh, increases. Okay. So notice that it's only in the suburban and the exurban that the lack of certification you know, has an effect. Okay. Uh, or the other way you can think about it, you know, within the city, there are no bees flying around that we do not detect a significant difference you know, when it comes to a lack of certification. So now let's look at the number of species present, not their abundances, okay? So when it comes to overall certification level, regardless of where you are in urban, suburban, or exurban, is the gold and platinum that actually gains the most species. So yes, there is a certification level effect, okay? Now notice over here that instead of the number of samples, we're looking at the number of individuals. So when it comes the difference between the, uh, the not certified and then the silver, the effect is not a function of uh, uh, species, but a function of individuals. So we, indeed you provide more flowers, these flowers allow then for the bees to have more babies. So you have you know, a greater number of individuals there but not necessarily a greater number of species. When it comes to the urbanization level, this is the one that completely floored us. Uh, we found no significant effect, okay, between the type of urban or suburban or exurban environment that these houses were located. We're like, oh my God, this is incredible. The interesting part, of course, happens at the interaction. So when you look at the urban environment, just like with uh, abundances, there was no significant difference in the effect of the uh, certification level. So you have more flowers, you have less flowers. It doesn't matter, you have the same number of species of bees. When you look at the suburban environment, that's where things get really, really interesting in which then the gold and platinum have a much greater number of individuals and also you have greater diversity. And finally, in the exurban environment, then the spread is even bigger. Okay, once more, notice that the non is totally flat, the silver is in the middle and the gold and platinum is uh, where it's happening. So yes, the kind of management that you exert upon your property. You know, the, the number of plants that you have, the diversity of plants that you have, the, the removal of natives, uh, of invasives, so on and so forth, does matter a lot to our bees, but it's very context dependent, extremely context dependent, okay? And when you look at the total bee species diversity, so it's now we're looking not at individual homes, but at the totality of species present, 
we see that the urban and has you know significantly greater number of total species compared to the ex suburban compared to the exurban, which is exactly what our hypothesis was predicting in which there is a filtering effect for bees and that filtering effect you know is then in the suburban so that original idea that there was no filtering effect is is basically we're rejecting that idea in favor of a filtering effect associated with the suburban environment and it has to deal with the way that floor resources the diversity of floor resources the way these floor resources are distributed across the environment as well as the total amount of impervious surface okay and this has led to a revision of how we see you know uh, cities you know, we know that cities are not the biodiversity deserts that people have thought but that they contribute a lot more to regional biodiversity and that that contribution may be important especially when nearby agricultural environments may have depleted pollinator uh, uh, species pool okay so what can we say well a cities host or at least some cities host a large uh, diversity of bees you know and but that diversity is not evenly distributed we know that there's correlation with the way that with the past history of the cities, at least in St. Louis, it's highly correlated with you know, the history of the housing discrimination and the way that cities invest in our green infrastructure. Okay. And that not only do homeowners uh, most take into account uh, biodiversity as a possible objective on the way we manage our lawns and our yards, but also uh, city managers, decision makers, you know, very rarely take into account by diversity as an objective of their management uh, goals. And we think that at least in the city of St. Louis, that is changing dramatically. And so how, where do we go next? Well, uh, again, conservation is really not much of a biological or ecological problem, it's a people problem. And we are collaborating with colleagues with the University of Missouri St. Louis, uh, Dr. Lara Zoron, who is in the Department of Communication, in order to understand how social network, how our personal interactions uh, lead to decision making and the transmission of information. And we are then applying that to determine how much facilitation, you know, how much we need to convert these, you know, green infrastructure to habitat that is welcoming to our native bees. And we're testing, you know, these, the, the, these various social structures that people have at work and in your backyard and with your neighbors, uh, so on and so forth, contribute to the spread of these facilitation programs these home conservation programs, and we're testing them against a range of statistical and mathematical theories that can tell us if this facilitation is best driven by direct communication, or is it a perception that is, you know, doesn't matter how much you tell me, it's really more a matter of how we see the environment, or if there are issues of wealth associated with this kind of, of structuring. So with that said, uh, this is a very large program, a very large project. Uh, there are a lot of people and a lot of organizations that contributed uh, uh, to this. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Mitch Lichman, uh, recently retired from the St. Louis Audubon Society. Uh, and the Living Earth Collaborative uh, has also contributed to uh, uh, our work and as well as the Smith Fellows uh, uh, contributing to Becky Tonieto's uh, postdoc. Needless to say, a lot of people had let us come and, and pester around in their yards and in their gardens and in their farms. And, and there's a lot of the owners and managers 
that have graciously tolerated us for all these years, as well as the people behind the scenes that have contributed to uh, either the identification or the prov uh, providing of uh, uh, specimens in order to have references. Okay, so with that said, uh, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Rada. Really uh, fascinating research and so many dimensions to it. There were a few questions that uh, um, had to do with the sampling methodology and I thought I'd ask those kind of together. So folks were interested in what time of year and also what time of day the sampling was done. Oh, oh, right, right, yes, yes. So, um, so for the first part, the very first part, we're looking at city parks and we're looking at urban farms and community garden. That one, we would start in April because, you know, flowering trees and so on and so forth, those are emerging. Actually, last year, they started emerging in March. But in general, we would start around, you know, tax day was our, our starting. And we would go until early October. And those were done every other week. So that was, there were a time that we have, you know, thousands of thousands of bees, you know, in the lab uh, 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 being processed. The second part, the one for Audubon Society, that one was done, you know, starting early May, all the way to early October. And those were done once a month. And as always, this is the great advantage of working with bees. Uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the, the term busy as a bee, it, it, it's a horrible term because bees are about the laziest organisms on earth. They, they don't start till 10 in the morning and, you know, by three o'clock they're done. Okay, they, they give doctor's hours a bad name. Okay, they, 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 these individuals are lazy every time that was cloudy or too windy or yeah, we're not going out. Okay. So most of the sampling was done, of course, during sunny days that were not terribly windy and between 10 o'clock and usually one o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, folks, I, um, we are at the top of the hour. So if you have to hop off, uh, feel free to do that. But I did open the chat box again, if you'd like to say a thank you uh, for our great uh, talk this morning, but we'll keep going with questions and those will be on the recording. Um, so there, um, the question at the very top was about mosquitoes. And I know that's something that you've explored as well. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about mosquitoes, uh, your work and um, effects of, of uh, methods of controlling mosquitoes. Okay, so uh, what we have found, it's a, the, 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 the big urban myth that has been built a lot into homeowners association rules and even into some municipalities ordinances is that you, you should not, you cannot have a messy yard, you cannot have overgrown vegetation because that leads to greater mosquito abundances, which leads to, of course, increased disease risk. What we have found is that that is not true at all. That having a platinum or gold certified yard that has a lot of bee, a lot of bees, a lot of, you know, a large vegetation has the exact same amount of mosquitoes as the one that is completely mowed and, and, and kept tidy. We found zero difference in terms of mosquitoes. Um, the second thing we, in terms of control, was that the, the main thing that matters is not spraying, it's not that the town comes, blah, blah, none of that matter at all. The only thing that matter was that you did not have water stagnant water sources in your yard. That was that the only thing that mattered. So if you make sure, you know, you're, you're in your yard, you're looking at flowers, make sure that you tip that water from, your, you know, from the planters, you know, that those are empty all the time. That's the one thing, you know, spraying and blah, blah, that none of that mattered at all. Great, several people were interested in, um, 
promoting this idea of unintentional uh, wild uh, type landscapes close to home. So can you offer, is there a website, some resources, some help on oh, getting this happening close yeah, to home? Uh, uh, definitely. Uh, there are a whole host of those. Um, uh, as I mentioned, Doc Ptolemy, he is probably, you know, he's, he's the, 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 the lead evan evangelist in, in this movement. Um, there, you know, uh, there's website from, there's one called Wild Ones that, you know, is, is nationwide, is recommended. Um, there is, uh, I want to say, you know, the, the, the wild, my wild yard, something like that. That is also so. Basically, it's it's like yeah, you 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 go hands off, and I think Mary can talk a lot more about this. She will talk about this a lot more tomorrow, in which basically you you seed bomb the the area, and then you let it go, you know. Uh, <laughs> so so I I, I would I, I would refer to her, her expertise in that area. Turn my mute off. Uh, several people asked about um, whether you looked at the neighbors or other surrounding landscapes when you pulled your, your data together and how that might affect abundance and, and diversity. Right, right. I mean, it's, it, we, we have a limited time here. Yes, we, we, we actually, uh, besides uh, uh, bees and mosquitoes, we're also looking at, of course, plants and we're looking at uh, birds in, and people. So, so this is a fairly large uh, project. And one of the things we're doing, basically, we're using, uh, uh, we're, we're driving up and down the street using a geostationary camera on top of the car to take pictures of the front yards of the houses. And, uh, and then we're putting that through, you know, an algorithm to determine, you know, the amount of plant complexity in, in the front yards and seeing how that influences and, and surprise, surprise, it does. You know, uh, how that, oh, love that coffee mug. Uh, yeah. uh, um, how many, uh, how your neighbors keep your, their yard and, and even more, more equally important, how much, how many weeds are growing in these vacant lots really influence, you know, how many, yard, how many bees you have in your yard. And that, that's, but that's really, really relevant inside the city. Another question that got lots of uh, upvotes is about vegetable gardening and whether um, those practices to keep a, a vegetable garden going might interfere with the uh, cycles of ground nesting bees. Uh, no, we, we, in general, we did not find that. Uh, and, and, and the reason being is that we also have uh, advised uh, so the main urban agriculture NGO in St. Louis, uh, it's called, uh, uh, it used to be called Gateway Greening, is now uh, Seeds for St. Louis. And we always advise them to leave bare ground, exposed bare ground for an area and even, you know, twigs and bramble and whatnot in a corner for the bees and plant natives uh, and most of the places have done so but we found that in gardens where uh, the people have a very specific aesthetic value of what my any yard any space have to be mowed and covered with grass and in those sites we made the recommendations uh, we provided the plants and and people said no, we're not following it. They 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 did not feel comfortable uh, following uh, that. They say so. I mean, they say you can lead the horse to water. So that kind of goes with the question that Diego asked. Uh, besides crops, are there ornamental plants? Besides crops and weeds, perhaps are there ornamental plants that you would advise a municipalities growing to better nourish bees? Yes, and and so this is a. a, a can be a little bit thorny issue, pardon the fun, uh, because it, it, it's a lot of plants have what we call uh, ecotypes. They, they are adapted to the very local conditions. So let's say 
that you have a purple clover, you know, purple clover is a bee that is a plant that only, you know, like Reed uh, mentioned yesterday, honeybees love clover. Well, lots of bees love clover. Uh, but, you know, you want to plant the clover that is better adapted to your specific location. Okay? So there are a whole host of species that are available. They are native species that provide, you know, nectar and pollen. And some are mostly pollen, some are mostly nectar. And you need flowers, you need plants that are flowering in the spring, in the summer, and into the fall. You need uh, flowers that, you know, provide very specific needs. You know, as I mentioned, uh, St. Louis is also kind of like a different, you know, unique city in the fact that we have a lot of specialist bees inside the city. Okay? So not, not only do we have a lot of diversity, there are a lot of specialists. So we have, just like we have the squash bee that the females only go to squash, we got things like hibiscus bee that only go to hibiscus. We have various, you know, sunflower bees that only go to sunflowers, blah, 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 blah. So in order, you, you want to make sure that when you're selecting plants uh, to maintain, you know, some kind of pollinator garden, you want to make sure that those do, that not only you have provide generalists, but also you provide uh, plants and flower resources for specialists. Great. Again, and that's wild, ones, wild ones will be a great resource for that. Great. Uh, a nice time for me to plug our Tending Nature uh, series, which starts in January, which we'll have uh, Doug Tallamy, we'll have um, uh, Brian Danforth talking about specialist bees, uh, Heather Holm and plants for bumblebees. So really focused on native plants and specifically what they offer. Uh, we'll have uh, Lisa Olson from Wild Ones as well. So nice. folks, you should have all gotten an email from me, um, one that you wanted this time about uh, that Tending Nature program. And I'll have that link to register going out in a follow-up email. Um, let's end with a question that Stephanie asked, uh, wondering if Audubon is planning to expand the Bring Conservation Home project be, uh, beyond St. Louis. Yes, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, uh, or, uh, Portland, Oregon already have it. They're running full full force. Uh, this, this is tremendously successful program. Uh, Baltimore was supposed to have started uh, and because of the pandemic, they, they had to put it on hold. Uh, I want to say Pittsburgh is also thinking about it. Um, so yeah, they're, they're really doing that because I mean, a lot of the other programs use what I call a participation trophy. You, you basically, you write a check to the organization. They sent you a, a, a sign that you hang on your, uh, on your yard. In, and this is important because my colleague, a communication colleague have found that feelings of, you know, of pride and joy are super important uh, in terms of involvement in self-efficacy uh, in order to change that that green lawn into a prairie habitat or, or a meadow, you know, you, you need to have that that drive. You need to have that that interest, and that's important. But the big difference here is that you no, know, many times you put that sign, and the 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 change is, can be very minimal or can be non. You know, you you decided today to do it, and then. You got to your plant supply and then, you know, you got your new shovel and the time you do that first shovel, you know, your back gives and, uh, you know, let's grab a beer and watch some football, <laughs> you know. So, so the great thing about Bring Conservation Home is that they come back, you know, after they give you that first assessment, they come back a second time and said, oh yeah, you meet silver or you did meet platinum or, you know, they tell you exactly what it is. And thus, you know, and we went back to make sure that that was happening. And we make sure of that in order for, to select the house. Okay, so, so it, that's the great difference of Bring Conservation Home. Mm -hmm. and, and having your powerful research behind it then to show those results, to show what's really happening oh, for pollinators right. rather than, you know, the feel good gets people motivated, but what's really happening on the ground is really uh, very oh, so I, I said, uh, Annalyn Moore, mentioned that we just got certified by Baltimore Audubon and we live in Bowie, Maryland. Excellent. Awesome. So yeah, so, so we're, we're, we're starting to talk to Audubon 
uh, in Portland because we want to then repeat the experiment in Portland. And if Marilyn is going, you know, uh, <laughs> Annalyn, you may see me in Baltimore in the, in the near future. You know, so you see a big brown guy, you know, walking around with the butterfly net. <laughs> 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 Great. So let's let's end there, Geraldo. Thank you so much. A really wonderful um, session. Appreciate your uh, expertise and um, the way you broke it down for us. Uh, folks, uh, lots of uh, thank yous in the chat box. Really appreciate that. Uh, we'll be back here tomorrow with Mary Gardner talking about vacant lots in Cleveland, her really exciting uh, prairie, pocket prairie research up there. And um, thanks again, Gerardo. And um, Folks, see you, see you next time. I, I have a, a one here that's from Rebecca uh, Mac, Mac, Mackin in New York City. Oh yeah, Gail Angelotto has been working in, in, in New York City. So yeah. So, okay, excellent. Great. Bye. Thanks all.